of some sort that was on the wall near the pool in the excavation, and it actually identified it as the pool of Siloam. So it's kind of cool. Siloam sent. The Feast of Tabernacles, which is what they have in this particular scripture, the priest at one point during the, at the end of the day will lead a procession and they get some water from the pool, they take it back to the temple. And they believe sent is symbolic of God's blessing <coughs> being sent to the Jewish people. And that was what was being symbolized as they were getting the water and they were taking it back to the temple. In fact, what we have is the Lord God sending his son, our Savior, to us. So Siloam is sent, is symbolic of that. So the pool of Siloam even has meaning for us today. Now what's interesting, the scripture doesn't say exactly, but that the man was in the vicinity of the temple when Jesus healed him. The distance from, and he told him to go to Siloam, pool, and wash. The distance is 700 yards. That's quite a distance. And at some point today I may ask you, why would Jesus have done that? And Jesus also used clay to mix, or excuse me, he made clay, he mixed spittle with uh, dust or dirt of the ground and put it on the man's eyes. Why in the world would Jesus do that? I mean, I'm asking you, somebody tell me, because y'all read this and you've got an idea about it and you maybe wondered and did a little research yourself, so why did Jesus use clay to put on this man's eyes? Five instances, give you this information to help you out, that Jesus healed blind folks. One time that he touched, that was in the book of Matthew, Another time, it was simply his words that healed. Another time, the same thing. This time, he uses saliva. Is Jesus limited? Why did he do it? Mike, you, I know, got an idea about why Jesus used clay. What was it? Well, I, I honestly don't know for certain, but um, I think that Jesus wanted him to participate in the miracle. Mm -hmm. And that would that was the reason behind it. Now, why he chose to do it in the manner he did, uh, I'm here to learn. That's an excellent answer, I think. Yeah, I don't have a clue. I read it, and I'm thinking, why did the Lord do it? Mickey, do you know? Well, no, but as you mentioned that, Naaman the Syrian had leprosy yeah. and was told to go wash in, I think it was the Jordan, and it was like he was insulted. We have so much better rivers over in Egypt or wherever else. And then the Jewish servant girl said, if he would have told you something crazy, you would have done it. So just go do what he told you. And he did, and he was healed. So again, I think he was participating in his own healing or, or with that healing. And he was obeying also. So there's a submission thing there, but I don't know. Yeah. You know, Charles used to preach a long time ago. He said, if you get a word from God, if you're reading scripture and the Holy Spirit checks or checks in your spirit and you get an indication you need to do something, go and do it. When? Right now. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying about obedience makes sense. And what you're saying about immediate obedience makes sense. When God tells you all to do something, when you get a check in your spirit about something in your life, have you immediately done it or did you put it off? Gail, you put it off in some time kind of past? You know I have. Um, but you know, also is by by Jesus asking him to do something. Remember, we're human beings, and our nature would be to say, "What? What the heck is that all about?" But he, it was almost like a test of faith. You're going to believe I'm going to heal you. So if you came to me for healing, and I tell you to do this, it's just a part of checking your faith in me. Yeah. By doing what I tell you to do. Yeah. I think everything you said is right. Mm -hmm. I think obedience, I think faith. Um, he had to participate in his own healing, or you just determined that that would be a good thing to do. Hold that thought, I'll come right back. Go ahead. You know, it could be that, that this man had to travel a certain distance to the pool, and people saw him. And even the, the passages that followed that, the Pharisees or these Pharisees were trying to trap them, you know. And so they said, they said to his parents, you, you know, this, he's a sinner. What do you have to say about that? And his parents and others around said, oh, well, I don't know about that. But there he stands right there. And I know he was blind and now I can see. So that witness... That could be why he had him travel a certain distance. I don't know. For Makes sense. Distances. I don't know either. I don't know the answer to it, but I think all of what y'all have talked about this morning is a part of it. 
we don't know everything. Uh, and it's a good thing that we don't. He's God. We're not. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to know everything. And personally, I accept that. I'm good to go. Mm -hmm. um, what we know is that he healed, as we'll talk about, different ways. But he's God. He can do what he wants to. It encourages me that he does things the way he does do them. It's different many times. But what prevents him? He is our God. And there is nothing impossible for him. Mike said so many times to us, his arm is not too short to save. And indeed, it is not. So this week's takeaway, what you ought to take away from this scripture at a minimum this morning, we need to examine our beliefs in light of scripture. What do you believe this morning? What's true to you? And I want to make a real quick point. I got very little time, so I'm going to go quickly. There was a study done in 2022, and they asked a lot of questions of the churchy community. Those are my terms. They include Catholics, they include one category and another category for evangelicals. That would be Presbyterians, Baptists, Lutherans, and typically the most conservative elements of those traditions. And they asked a number of different questions. But one question when we're talking about what we believe, they asked the question about pluralism. And as you know, pluralism is simply there are many religions, and they're all good to go. They all get us to God. Islam gets us to God. Judaism gets us to God. Christianity gets us to God. <clears throat> Buddhism gets us to God. Hinduism, and there are a number of others that I'm failing to mention. Don't have time. But they all get us to God. That's pluralism. Whatever you believe is good to go. That's pluralism. They ask this question of the evangelical, or excuse me, the, the total community. I think there was something like 306, three, excuse me, 3,600 participants. They asked that question, and it includes, included some non-Christians. Uh, and it, the, the answer was 60%, over 60% believe that it didn't matter what, you, what your religion was. You could be a Muslim, or you could be a Christian, or you could be a Jewish folk, or a Hindu, a Hindu folk. You could get to God, no problem. God doesn't have a problem as long as you're sincere, and you've heard that. Over 60% believe that that is true. Now, here's the kicker. Over 50%, it was something like 53 to 55% of evangelical, which includes Baptists, believed the same thing, that you can believe or be, a, be a Muslim and you get to heaven. So I'm going to ask you the question this morning. What do you believe? I believe that the word of God is spoken to all the nations and kingdoms for the sake of all humanity. They were made a little bit lower than angels, but they've got to earn their right for being obedient to the word of God so they can live in the highest. You surprised me with that. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> and I'll, uh, my, my, but let me try this. My question was rhetorical. I don't really want an answer. But thank you for that. I'm kidding around. I'm kidding around. Kidding around. Thank you for that. Um, we need to know, and I've said it to you many times, and Charles said forever, and Pastor Cliff says it all the time, we need to be intelligent Christian. What do you believe? What is your theology? Do you spend enough time in Scripture that you understand what right theology is? Can you look at somebody preaching to you, listen to somebody preaching to you, and understand if what they're saying to you is correct? Can you? If somebody preaches a lie or preaches something, then maybe slightly off, which is what happens most often. Mm -hmm. A preacher not too long ago, and I mentioned this one to you, he preached 34,000 members in his church in Atlanta. He said the Old Testament ought to be unhitched from the New. I don't have words for that. But we need to be smart enough about Scripture. You need to know what you believe. You need to be in Scripture well enough that nobody can fool you. Because what happens in the end times? And I don't know when that's going to be or if we're there. But the Scripture itself says, God himself says to us, Jesus himself says to us, that even the elect may be fooled in those days may be deceived, excuse me, in those days. And that's talking about you and me. So you better know what you believe. That's important to have a correct theology. And I will tell you, Hank talked about it one Sunday, we have the Baptist faith and message that, that drives what we believe that is a statement of our theology in this particular Baptist church. Now that doesn't mean down the road in another Baptist church they've got the same thing going on, okay? Probably don't. Well, we got to be careful. This church is good to go. You need to know what that is about, and you need to have your beliefs grounded in Scripture, solidly grounded on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Go ahead, D.R. Yeah, just real quick. Something that's always stuck with me, there's a program called the Truth Project. Del Tackett at the beginning of it says, <coughs> do you believe that what you believe is really real? And then he 
goes through a 10 uh, hour session of breaking down the Christian worldview of what we actually believe in why. It's, it's fantastic. So, I mean, for me, it was great on helping me process it and for me and my family to, to really break down the Christian theology and, and cool. what we believe. Cool. Good to go. Thank you. Yeah. We can share with others. We should take that from the scripture today. We should share with others what we believe. And we get that all the time. Y'all know it. And I know that you believe it. We need to actually do it. We believe it. Let's do it. Uh, we worship the Lord both in our faith, when we go up there later on, but also in our actions. And we've talked about that. That you belong to Jesus Christ or they're reflected in your actions. And I'm sure with you all they are. We only talk about that other church over there. Okay, Jesus performed more miracles of this kind, healing the blind, than he did of any other. He used, as we talk about, different ways to heal because he is God. Uh, scripture says about giving sight to the blind, in that day the deaf will hear the words, this is from Isaiah, the words of the scroll, and out of gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind will see. Jesus came. They accused him of being a misleader, a deceptor. He was out front, open with everything that he did. This is just one example of the miracles that he did. Who could open the eyes of a congenitally blind man or woman? But God Almighty. I, go and research. You just don't see that. Now, of course, there are medical uh, uh, processes today that do things that are in and, in and of themselves miraculous, and we know all that comes from God, of course. But uh, at that point in time, and with the state of the medical profession at that point in time, it was simply unheard of. It, it wasn't done. But Jesus Christ did that. It's important that we understand. They were additional evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. They said to Jesus when he was standing before the Sanhedrin, tell us plainly. He told them over and over again. There are scholars who say that during the time of Jesus' ministry, those three years, he ministered from Judea, the southern part of Judea. And as you know, that's the southern part of Israel. Um, not in its entirety, but it's the populous part. All the way up to Tyre and Sidon. So in the northwest, all the way up to Lebanon. Today, Lebanon, Phoenicia back then. He ministered all throughout Israel, north, south, east, and west. And the scholars say that there were very few sick people. There were very few people who uh, were crippled. Because Jesus healed them all. Now, I don't know how accurate that is, but that's what some scholars say. Well, I'll tell you this. When he left, there were a whole lot fewer than when he came. Whatever those numbers might have been. And they were only those who were not healed or um, healed from their infirmity, healed from their sicknesses, healed from demon possession because they didn't come to Jesus. What does Scripture say about Naaman? When, when Naaman was healed... Were there not lepers in Israel? Well, of course there were. And this guy comes from Assyria, and he's a bad guy. He's a doggone terrorist by some descriptions because he would raid into Israel and take captives back. The little girl who told him about uh, the prophet Elijah, Elijah was uh, his captive and had been stolen away from Israel. So today is the application. Do we need healing today? Spiritually, some of us do. Do we need blessing today? We all do. Do we need help today? We all do. Why do we have not? Because we ask not. There you go. So, Scripture says, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. I tell you, you read this and you get a sense of the Pharisees. Their arrogance is mind-boggling. God bless them. They were some arrogant bubbles. They sure would. But you know, we got folks like that today. Don't be in that group. Don't be full of prejudices and biases and have notions that are not grounded in what you believe in Scripture and not grounded in love. What did God say? He said, love one another. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. And what's the second which is likened to it? There you go. How y'all doing with that? You know, the biggest problem, and I told y'all this, I'm going to say it again because I need to make a confession. The biggest problem I have is loving people. Now, not y'all. I love all y'all. I do. I love every one of y'all sitting there this morning. I pray about it. I have to pray about it. Y'all y'all have to pray about other people. It's, it's one of the greatest commandments because it's important to God. No question about it. It makes sense. 
it makes for a good fellowship. But, I mean, can you imagine just be, feeling, be filled with hate? My goodness. I can because I spent a lot of my life being that way. It's not good. The love is the important thing that we need to be doing for one another. We need to be loving each other. I pray about it and I love y'all to death. I tell you what. Golly. Y'all some sweet people. So, they questioned both the formerly blind man and his parents. The blind man, twice. They implied that he had not told the truth. This man been healed, congenitally blind, and he's going to lie about it. That didn't even make sense. But they questioned him. They, they implied that he was a liar. They put, by their questioning and by what they were doing with this man, they put their unbelief on center stage. It was like, hmm, there was no way they were going to accept. They were spiritually blind as they could be. They're, and here's the thing. You read about anybody celebrating for this guy. He'd been blind from birth. And you don't hear about or you don't read about anybody who got tickled about it. I mean, if you're blind from birth and you're healed, you can see all of a sudden, what a wonderful world out there. Y'all been down to the Keys and been diving, some of y'all down there. How beautiful is that world under the under the, uh, the sea? It's so beautiful, my goodness. In this world around us, it's so beautiful, sometimes I can't even think about it. It's incredible. What a wonderful gift of sight our Lord God has given us in this poor man. He didn't have it most of his, all his life. And Jesus gives it to him. He's not going to lie about it. Why weren't they celebrating? <coughs> the Pharisees, you see where their heart is. There was no celebration. Let's call him a liar, prove him a liar, and this man's a sinner. Makes no sense. Where is your heart in all that this morning? You celebrating what God does? Are you celebrating what God does in your life? We, every one of us sitting here this morning, have a gift that's so so marvelous, so wonderful, so breathtaking, we ought to be dancing out of here. Some of y'all look like y'all were going to dance last night. Y'all were happy and having a good time. This morning, it should be the same way. Now, I'm being serious here for a second. What God has done for us is almost incomprehensible. What he has done for us, how, how are we expressing our gratefulness for us, for the great gift of salvation that we have? Are we doing everything that we should to show that we are grateful? You give somebody something at Christmas and you don't hear anything back from them, if it's your kid, you probably overlook it because this generation, I guess, that's what they do. But you kind of look for a little bit of gratefulness, don't you? Now, you don't put too much emphasis on that because you give them because you love them. And I got that. But it'd be nice if they say thank you, wouldn't it? Yeah. Anybody agree with me? Okay. Yeah, I got an amen out there on that one. A little gratefulness is good. You don't see that, which is incredible. But here's what I know. That was a human condition. It's the way people are. Without Christ, that's the way we are. How are you sitting there this morning? Are you as grateful as you need to be? Roy? Hey, Dan. The same Adrian and Pharisees of those, they saw Jesus as a threat. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want him to upset their apple cart. Yeah. That's what I said. They yeah. saw him as a true threat, and they didn't want anything to do with that. They wanted to get rid of him. Yeah, and I'm going to add to that because it's important to understand about the Pharisees. And I mentioned to y'all there are about 6,000 of them. People looked up to them. They, um, those guys, everything that went on in the temple, they got a cut. What I'm talking about, they got money out of it. Jesus was taking money out of their pockets. He was not only a threat so far as the people looking at him as an authority. I mean, they were drawn to him because he was God. He was the son of God. He was the Savior. They were drawn to him, of course. We would be today. Drawn to Jesus like no other. And of course they were jealous. Of course they didn't like that. But at the same time, uh, not only was there, uh, not only were they being humiliated because it was obvious they were hypocrites and Jesus was showing that, but he was also taking money out of their pocket. People would bring a sacrifice to the temple and the money changers and they also had sellers of livestock up there that were unblemished. So the priest would say, now your, your uh, lamb is blemished you got to go get one over here. So they would cause a person to go have to buy another sheep that somebody was selling, and they got a cut of that. And don't take my word for it. Look it up. Research it, and you'll see if that's the case. And the chief priest, high priest, got the biggest cut of all. And that just ain't funny. You, you love these people? Do you really? Yeah. And Jesus poured his heart out for the Pharisees and Sadducees as well. Throughout the whole time, he's... 
he's going after <coughs> their hearts as much as possible. I mean, he's calling them hypocrites, but he's also saying, so that they will know that I have authority on earth to forgive sins, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. He told the paralytic on the mat, right in front of the Pharisees, so that they will know. So he is trying to get them one at a time to trust him as Lord and Savior. And we're talking about probably the, 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 the great majority of the Pharisees, but not all the Pharisees. We had Nicodemus. We had right. Joseph of Arimathea. Yes. They, and there were leaders at Pentecost, Scripture says, who came to know the Lord. So it wasn't all the Pharisees. It was just a portion of the Pharisees. There was a remnant among those uh, there. Now, and here's saying another thing to consider, and this is a matter of trivia, and I'm going to say this real quick. If you look at the theology of the Pharisees, if you look at the theology of the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Herodians, the theology of the Pharisees, apart from the traditions of man, more closely lined up with what Scripture had than any other. So that Jesus would reach out to them makes a lot of sense, and he did, in fact, and they rejected him in great part. So going on, the hardness of their hearts, their hypocrisy, prevented a concern for their brother. They were only interested in proving Jesus, Jesus as a sinner. Excuse me. Their tr tradition took place over God, as we have talked about. The Lord God Almighty, who had created them, was standing in their midst, and they rejected him. We need to be sure we don't be doing the same thing. Excuse my English. They were spiritually blind. Scripture says in Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God. That's what Jesus Christ was then. The firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He did miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. He said who he was time and again. He preached to the people. He preached with authority. And they missed it. They had scales on their eyes. They had hearts that were hard. They were not able to see. We need to be sure we're not in the same situation. So... The people who reject Christ are lost, are the lost, and we don't want to be among those. There was a time when Jesus, some of the disciples who had been following him went away because he had said some things that were hard. He was talking about uh, partaking of his body and his blood. They couldn't get, it, they couldn't get around that. And uh, many of his disciples at the time that happened went away from him. Jesus asked them, what about you talking to his disciples? Will you go away as well? And he asked us, today because sometimes life is hard for us and there are those who walk away. What are you going to do this morning? Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord to whom shall we go? Who are you going to go to? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know. Have you this morning come to know? And what about those you love? Have those you love come to know? And if they haven't, what are you doing about it? You better be praying at a very minimum. And God can do what through prayer? He can do anything because nothing is impossible for God. Gail. I just want to mention, because there's a big crowd here, there's a there's two commercials coming on tonight, the Super Bowl, and I'm, I'm only going to be brief, but they're about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus gets you. And some of the things on Facebook just said, be prepared to talk about those commercials and talk about Jesus because they're preventing Jesus to the world during commercials. And maybe it will be an opportunity to share your testimony. That's it. Oh, wonderful. He went on to say that you are the Holy One of God. Because He is all that He claimed to be, we need to be reflecting that in our lives. Don't be spiritually blind. They chose simply not to accept that Jesus was who He said He was. Excuse me. <clears throat> Lost my place. They told the man, give God the glory. The man, uh, Jesus violated their traditions and they were looking for any way to label him a sinner, any way to label him a rebel of the, of the law of Moses. They said, we know that this man is a sinner. When you look at that scripture and it says we, the Greek is emphatic. Their hearts were so hard and so biased that it comes out in every word that comes out of their mouth. We know with emphasis. What do you know this morning? Do you speak the same way about Jesus Christ as you know him? Do you know him? Can you say it emphatically? 
Can you say it with conviction? Can you say it in such a way that when somebody asks you because they watch that commercial Gail was talking about, that you can convince them that Christ <laughs> is who he said he was? Or at least provide an argument that makes sense that will cause someone to consider what <coughs> Jesus says about himself. Mm -hmm. This man, he replied when he was asked these questions. He replied whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. That's pure logic. That's pure logic. These guys who are questioning him are supposed to be educated. <laughs> they had the, the masters and the bachelors and the doctor degrees of the doctor degrees of that time. And he smokes him like a cheap cigar with simple logic. He, there's a uh, there's a Latin term, and I won't do any Latin here this morning because I can't even speak English sometimes, but it's a principle in law, and it means the thing speaks for itself. And that was exactly what he was saying to him. I was blind, but now I see. It speaks for itself, yet they denied it. Why? Because they had a will, they had hard hearts, blind, spiritually blind, but they had a will not to believe. We had weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I'm sorry, I'm getting on a rabbit chase here, and I'll shut up and go real quick. And I know it for a fact, but did you ever hear it in the news? No, you didn't. And they will call me a liar if they heard me say that today, but I know what I'm talking about, and if anybody has an interest, I'll prove it to you. Now, I'm sorry for that, but I just had to say it. Because there was a will not to believe. There was a political agenda, and we don't want to believe the truth because we got this agenda. Same thing happens today that happened back then. But that's much more, what happened back then is much more important than weapons of mass destruction. <clears throat> they had a will not to believe. And what is the application to you and I? What do you believe in this morning? Are you believing correctly, rightly, based in scripture, based in sound theology? Be sure that you do. That's a lesson to take from this. It spoke, the truth spoke for itself. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I told you already, and you didn't listen. He's not being nice now. He's telling the truth. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Now that too, of course, indicates that he may have been becoming a disciple. And I expect he would. Don't know, scripture's not explicit, but just had my sight given back to me, or given to me for the first time. I'm probably gonna pay attention to what you're talking about. But how in the world did they react? You remember the Pharisees, when they brought the woman to Jesus to, uh, talking about stoning her because she was caught in adultery, they walked away ultimately. Well, these Pharisees, they walked away too. They put their hand up to Jesus. We can't be guilty of doing that. Then they hurled, uh, he uses, it was incredible logic that he used. And their, their questions were just absolutely an open display of their willingness not to believe as we said. Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple, which was probably true. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he come from. We know God spoke to Moses. They say they're disciples of Moses, but these guys with all their education don't know scripture. I know scripture better than some of these doctors, and that's not bragging about me. That's just, they should have taken time to read the scripture that they had. They had the Pentateuch. The five books of the law. Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. They had it. They had the prophets. They had the prophets. They had no excuse, but they hadn't read them. They had not read them. They said, we know about Moses. We have, we listen to Moses. We are his disciples. But they didn't know the scripture. What did the Lord Jesus say in Luke 24 to the two disciples that he spoke with on the road to Emmaus? Y'all remember? Mm -hmm. That is critical scripture for a couple reasons. You're going to have people say to you, this is just a good story, as I've talked about. And I'm sorry for hammering, but you hear that all the time. Scholars today approach this scripture as if it has no supernatural element to it. It's just like any other book. Shakespeare has as much fidelity as the scripture does. Well, I make the difference. What did it say in Luke 24? Jesus began to teach those disciples because they didn't understand. And what does it say that he began to teach them from? Moses and the prophets. Scripture. Jesus validated himself. If somebody tells you this is not inerrant, 
it is not infallible, that it's not the word of God, that it is not God breathed, won't know what you're talking about. You can prove it extra biblically. And it's too easy to do it. Their comments are based generally on what they heard somebody else say. How many times do you hear that? You listen to the news. It's what somebody else told them to say. It's not what they know for a fact. It's what they are telling you that they heard from somewhere else. How many times you get to a discussion with somebody and they repeat what they have heard, but it has no validity, it has no basis in fact, there's no foundation. But too many times we accept that kind of foolishness. Excuse me, I don't mean to get carried away. But this is the word of God. God breathed and Jesus validated it himself in Luke 24. So there you go. They talk about Moses, they got no clue about Moses. Moses wrote about Jesus Christ in Deuteronomy 18.15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet. Talking about Jesus Christ. Every scholar who is legitimate agrees. Raise up a prophet for you among your brothers, from among your brothers. Jesus Christ. They don't know Moses. They were wrong. They were making arguments based out of ignorance. Don't us be guilty of the same thing. Know what the scripture says. Be conversant in scripture. Now, the man answered. He is awesome. Now that is remarkable, or some translations that we said. Now that is amazing. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. The man uses a soliloquy. He is uneducated, and he outlogics these, excuse me, these doctors. They got no clue. He made the point that only someone who comes from God can heal a congenitally blind man. Jesus Christ. Healed me. Here's a soliloquy. Here's his point. He had to come from God because of what he did. Otherwise, he couldn't have done it. How can you dispute that? Yet they did. They concluded that he was wrong. Wow. And they threw him out of the temple. You didn't hear anything in here, or you didn't read anything in here about the man complaining about being thrown out of the temple because he loved Jesus. The scripture goes on, and I'm out of time, so I've got to go. go I've got a minute. He believed. Jesus asked him. Amen. He said, I'm he. And he asked him if you believe. And he said, I, I believe. He became a Christian. He went from, from being physically blind. And Jesus blessed him and gave him a sight back. And he went to being spiritually wide open. And how would he do the world then? Yeah. Accepting his Savior. Who had a hand? Danny, go ahead. The beauty about the Holy Bible and the other religions in this world is all the prophecy of here that has happened and has come true and has been approved. One thing that always fascinated me is when God stopped everything for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Several years ago, our scientists found out that actually happened. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty about this Bible. And a lot of the other religions do not have the prophecy that has happened and it has also been approved. Yeah. So it's one day. If you take the time and you look at all the religions out there, or you look at a few of them, look at Islam, look at Hinduism, look at um, whatever, and you compare it with Christianity. Personally, I have seen nothing that compares. I have seen nothing that makes sense. I've seen Islam up close. I had an Islamic man, I had a relationship with a counterpart, and he liked me, and so he was duty bound by Islam um, beliefs to try to convert me to show me the right way so he had some guy come in and he preached to me for 30 minutes and um, he talked about Jesus being only this is Islam people tell you Islam is a great religion um, I beg to differ it's not a great religion either it's, it may be a great religion in size but it's not a great religion in what they believe they believe that Jesus was only a prophet they don't believe in the virgin birth there's a lot of things they don't believe that we believe the most the most important thing is they don't believe Jesus was our savior nor that he died on the cross Islam is not a great religion. If you examine all those religions out there, you're going to find nothing that comes close to what our, our God has for us. This blind man saw it, and we should be able to see it as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day and the blessings of it. Thank you for it. These, your people, the sheep of your pasture, dear, dear God, who are here this morning. And, and Lord, I just pray that you'll have mercy on them. I pray that you'll bless them. I pray you'll cover them over with your wings. That you'll bless their families, their children, grandchildren, extended families. Pray that you'll cover them as they go from here, as they go to their homes. Please keep them safe, Father. 
Lord, you heard the requests that were just made this morning. There are a lot that are, that are unspoken. But we lift those up. We join our hearts and we lift them to you because you are our helper. You're the one we look to because you created us. You created the heavens and the earth and there is none like you. In all of the cosmos, there is none like you. You alone can answer the prayers of your people. And we know that, so we lift them up, Father, and ask you please to have mercy on us this morning. Lord, we acknowledge what a great and a good God you are. You are great and you are good. You are perfectly good, Father. There is none, there is none beside you. Only you, Lord Jesus. And so we lift all these requests. We lift our prayers. We lift our worship and we ascribe all glory to you. We lift them up in your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.